right now I am outside the city of Carentan. And in June of 1944, this was a vital, vital objective for U.S. forces because it was going to provide the place where U.S. forces coming up off of Omaha Beach and off of Utah Beach could link up. And many are familiar with the name Carentan from the series uh, Band of Brothers, but there was a costly action uh, that occurred right here along this road prior to what you see in Band of Brothers uh, along this route that is now known as Purple Heart Lane. As many may already know, the, the fields in the area around Carenton were flooded prior to D-Day to hinder the movements of the paratroopers who were going to be landing in this area. And this road right here was along a causeway that led into the city of Carenton that the 101st Airborne was going to have to attack along. And there were four bridges that they would have to basically move through in order to get to their objective. So this is bridge one right here and up here is bridge two. And uh, along with us today is somebody who knows this story way better than I do, and really any story in Normandy. Uh, we've got Paul Woodage from World War II TV with us today. So down this road behind me is Carenton, Utah Beach behind the camera, Omaha Beach about 15 miles that way. To link those beachheads, it had to be done by uniting the two beachheads through the town of Carenton. Attacking Carenton from the direction of Utah Beach was never going to be easy because of the geography of the summer of 1944. Floods either side of the road as caused by the Germans and down this road into Carenton, the Americans came with four bridges over four waterways the Douve River and various tributaries. Before the Americans begin the attack, they'd actually blown up this bridge here. It was a Falchimega uh, corporal called August Goneman. And the Falchimega referred to this as Goneman's Bridge because he destroyed this to make it a barrier, choosing, in fact, the widest bit of water to make this barricade. They blow the bridge. The unit pushing down this road towards Carenton is 3rd Battalion, 50 Deuce, 502nd, commanded by Robert Cole. And Robert Cole's men are pushed down here. They get here the night of June the 8th, morning of the 9th. They find it's been blown up. They improvise a crossing here by making planks of woods and bits of rope and things like that. And they cross over there. It takes them the whole night to get the battalion across there. And then the next day they pick up this battle down towards Carenton. Unfortunately, in Carenton were several hundred, if not the low thousands of 6th Falschermäger. Some really good German paratroops under the command of Colonel von der Heidt. There's an, a German tank park where various armoured vehicles are under repair are, are there in Carenton. They may not be drivable, but their guns still work. Von der Heidt and his men have them targeting this road here. So there's artillery fire, mortar fire. There's a farmhouse just on the outskirts of Carenton that was pro to prove to be a tough, tough nut to crack. And down this road is where the Third Battalion 502nd pushed. When we leave them here in a minute, we'll drive down. It will take us 30 seconds or so to drive from here to the... Bridge three and bridge four. It took the 502nd about a day to make that same journey because they're under murderous fire from all directions, including artillery, including mortars. At one point with the floods either side of the road, the men are kind of almost crawling down the road, passing clips of ammunition over their shoulders. The guy in front is kind of standing up with the rifle and trying to move on. And they realize they're not going to get anywhere unless they're a bit more aggressive and assertive. And this is where Cole, Colonel Cole, in typical fashion, kind of pulls his 45 and holster and urges his men on, just despite the withering gunfire, get on. And they push on down the bridge, over bridge number three. They get to bridge number four. Bridge number four was a smaller bridge, but it was blocked by a Belgian gate, one of the beach obstacles they had used on the beaches. The Germans had put it in the middle of the bridge. As they're squeezing past that, they come under some German... Uh, dive bombers, the accounts say they were Stukas, I don't know they were Stukas, maybe BF-110s, but a couple of German aircraft, probably from Brittany, came in. A couple of men are killed going past 
the, 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 uh, the obstacle and there they are with Caranton tantalizingly in sight but there's now this um, almost hedgehog set of German depositions ahead of them that they know are heavily fortified and uh, we will continue that story further down the road uh, that we now call Purple Heart Lane. I don't think I'm spoiling anything by saying that the casualties here were, were, were horrendous and it was still referred to by the moniker of Purple Heart Lane. But we'll carry on down the, the, the road. We've moved just down the road a little bit towards Carenton and off in the distance right here, well, that is bridge number three. And you can just imagine these massive fields on either side of the road being one giant lake. And these poor 101st guys are having to advance right along this causeway which is obviously going to funnel them down until they get right up here to bridge number four. Now at bridge number four they were going to be able to fan out a little bit but this is right on the outskirts of Carenton so as you can imagine this was going to be a heavily defended spot. So we've come a few hundred yards down the causeway and a few hours down in the timeline we got with the night of the 10th and 11th of June. Now that night there was actually an almost an unofficial ceasefire, a truce, where Germans and Americans were going out and getting their respective wounded and taking them back to their respective areas and it was it was based on a spirit of camaraderie but also on the fact that when the Americans were helping Germans take their wounded back to the positions where they were they could have a look at where the Germans were and the Germans could have a look at where the Americans were. So there was a bit of intelligence gathering going on but these are tales I've even heard of an, a German one end of a stretcher of the American the other end taking their respective wounded back to their aid stations. But the morning of the 11th of June, the, the bridge number four was, had been blocked by the Belgian gate. They've got past that now. Some men of Thurbertan 502nd are dug in where we are here on this, the, the outside of Caranton side of the, of, the, of the little tributary. Some are dug in the other side of the tributary. And the goal is Caranton down the, down the main road. But the, the, to get to Caranton, we're going to get it past the cream colour building over there that at the time was the only building, now it's surrounded by an industrial area, but you have to kind of use your imagination. But that cream colour building was kind of the focal point of the German Falschmäger defence, several machine guns around it and then a hedgerow that was running parallel to the causeway where fire had been coming from. On the morning of the 11th, sun is coming up, coal and Major Stopka is here. Stopka had been at Marmy on a farm June the 6th that JD's talked about in the past. Um, part of the famous photos that he's here as well, Major Stopka. And these guys know that where they are here, the Germans know they're here. They, they realize they've got this point and even if they don't move, when the sun comes up and the Germans get their act together, they'll come under mortar fire. So it's like, don't want to go backwards, don't really want to stay here, you've got to push on. And this is when Cole and Stopka crawl from man to man along here in Thurbertan 50 Deuce and say, right, have a cigarette, it may be the last one you ever have because in a minute I'm going to blow this whistle, we're going to fix pan it, so we're going to charge that farmhouse and just get those Germans out of there and, and, and move on. Now whether or not everybody did fix pan it is another, another matter, whether anybody, everybody heard the order. Now Cole had tried to coordinate Maxwell Taylor, the commanding officer division, to lay some smoke to support this advance, but whenever I've been here in the past, which is many times in, the, in, in my life, there's always a wind blowing across here as there is today, and the smoke that was fired from the mortars got blown away almost immediately, so there's no smoke to cover this advance. Anyway, G, H and I Company start charging their way across, and it's several hundred yards of open ground, they're zigzagging as they're trying to avoid the machine gun fire, and the first group of them make their way into the farmhouse. Cole was one of the first men into the farmhouse himself. And the losses of the G, H and I Company, I forget the exact figures right now, but the I Company got like 20 guys there and G Company got 18 guys there. And I, you know, I, you know it's, it's, it's not very many. They're not all dead, these guys. And we must remember that they, these companies didn't start this advance at full strength. This is a week after D-Day, nearly, 
they've already lost a few guys but the losses along this Purple Heart Lane were considerable. Anyway they have made the farmhouse, they've, they've just about dislodged the Germans there, the Germans are falling back to an area we now call the Cabbage Patch, there's more fighting on going on there to come but uh, Cole is now radioing back to Max Ortega to say look we're there but we're not there there, we're only at the beginning of Carenton, we haven't got enough people with us to push on, you need to do something to break the deadlock. Um, and this is when Taylor brings in the 506th, who had been mopping up snipers in the Angervilla plan area, and they come down to where we were a minute ago near bridge number two, and they do a flanking maneuver, and 2nd Battalion 506th with Easy Company in the Vanguard do a big loop southwest. And the next morning, the morning of June the 12th, they come in from the southwest direction of Carenton, and they are the unit that actually makes that final concerted effort into Carenton and, and, and seizes the liberation. When we talk about that, we've got to talk about this event first, because this was the first attack, and then at the same time, elements of the 327th glider are coming in from the other direction of Carenton, down the, 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 the canal there. So it's a divisional attack that's going into Carenton. We've moved out from bridge number four. So bridge number four is right back over here. And on the morning of June 11th, sun's getting ready to come up. Cole and his men are in a very exposed position. So they have to do something. They can't go back. The only way is forward. So there's stories that they, there was an order to fix bayonets. Uh, and they are going to make a charge, which I'm estimating is maybe two to three hundred yards, all the way up to where the Fallschirmjäger troops are, right here at the Inguf farm. So again, this is the Inguf farm where the Fallschirmjäger troops were staged up and guarding the causeway. Also guarding the causeway were several German machine gun positions right here in this hedgerow. So you can imagine just how frightening it must have been and how much bravery these guys had to muster up when uh, Cole orders this charge right from this bridge all the way up here to this position. And, and Colonel Cole uh, was one of the, the first men in. So this is an example of a commander leading from the front. When you move up close to the Ingu farm here, they have this sign that is dedicated to the men who fought here. Uh, it says Colonel Robert G. Cole's command post was situated here. It is from this place and under his command that the 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment launched their bayonet attack on the Cabbage Patch. This plaque is dedicated to the memory of the men who fought for our liberty. And you can still see evidence of what happened here imprinted on the walls of these buildings. Now, in recent years, unfortunately, this home has been painted this cream color and the bullet holes have been filled in, although you can still see some dings in the wall there. But if you look back at this far wall, well, you can see bullet damage all along this wall all from Robert Cole's attack here across from uh, Purple Heart Lane. Walking these grounds, it's hard to imagine what it must have took to muster up the courage that these guys had to, to make this attack on this German position. These are ordinary guys who did extraordinary things and managed to crack the outer defenses of uh, a Cairn town here. But uh, the cost would be high. Out of the 600 men who were accounted for at the very beginning, only 200 remained at the end. Uh, I Company was hit especially hard. Out of 120 guys, there were only 13 left at the end of this assault. Uh, and appropriately, here around Bridge 4, they have a memorial to Colonel Cole and the men who took part 
in the attack along Purple Heart Lane. Here at the memorial site, they have an aerial image that was taken after the war that really does a good job of kind of orienting us as to where we are. So this is where we started off at bridge number one over the Douve, and then Cole and his men are advancing over bridge two, over bridge three, and they're just advancing down this causeway until they get to this spot right here. And then the charge is going to go right here to the Ingu farm. Yeah, I'm really glad that they've put this up here because this, this really helps to visualize what happened here. Right here by bridge number four, they have this monument to Robert Cole and his men commemorating the charge that they made to breach the outer defenses of Carenton. And here on this artist depiction of the event, well, you see Robert Cole with his pistol drawn, leading the way and urging his men forward. Uh, we also have another soldier who is dropped down to his knee and is aiming. And also, if you really look closely, uh, see that he is wearing a German holster and belt rig and also has a Luftwaffe belt buckle, uh, depicting that he had picked that up from a defeated German. And then as we look up the monument even more, it tells that this is in Carentown, June 1944. And at the very top, you'll notice the image of the Medal of Honor. In October of 1944, Colonel Robert Cole would be awarded the Medal of Honor for the leadership and bravery that he exhibited here along Purple Heart Lane. But unfortunately, he would never see it. It's because during Operation Market Garden, uh, Robert Cole was shot by a sniper uh, on September 18th of 1944. So he, he died probably not even knowing that, that he was going to be awarded our nation's highest honor for bravery in combat. But anyway, that was a little bit on the fighting that took place right here in June of 1944.